Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arua, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 204 of our Pharmacotherapy MCQ series which is a collection of clinical vignettes. And the first question reads which of the following is a pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic consideration when dosing medications in critically ill patients who are undergoing the induction and maintenance phases of targeted temperature management TTM. Is it a. Increased gastric emptying. Or b. Altered enzymatic function. Or c. Increased biliary drug clearance. Or is it D. Enhanced drug clearance due to increased urine output? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, B. Altered enzymatic function. I will try and clarify why. Renal perfusion is decreased in TTM leading to decreased drug clearance. Biliary drug clearance is decreased during TTM. Enzymatic function is reduced due to TTM leading to accumulation of active metabolites and a prolonged duration of effects. Gastric emptying is decreased with unpredictable effects on oral absorption during TTM. Please advance to the next question. And the next question reads, the maintenance phase of targeted temperature management TTM, of PLR, a 68-year-old male patient has been going on for the past 12 hours. Some of his pertinent vital signs include a body temperature of 32.2 degrees Celsius, a blood pressure of 85 systolic and 48 diastolic, a heart rate of 45 beats per minute, a respiratory rate of 20 breaths per minute and a central venous pressure of 12 millimeters of mercury. PLR has a RASS of negative 4. He has not required any additional bolus doses and is saturating 95% on assist control mechanical ventilation. PLR received an amiodarone 150 mg bolus and was initiated on an amiodarone infusion at 1 mg per minute for atrial fibrillation which he has received for 240 minutes. PLR's infusions include norepinephrine 30 micrograms per minute, phenylephrine 50 micrograms per minute, fentanyl 150 micrograms per hour, and midazolam 4 milligrams per hour. So my question to you is which of the following would be the most appropriate choice to manage PLR's hypotension and bradycardia? Would it be a discontinue the amiodarone infusion, or b. increase the norepinephrine infusion rate, or c. administer an IV fluid bolus of normal saline, or would it be d. decrease the fentanyl and midazolam infusion rates. I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options.
and the correct answer is a discontinue the amiodarone infusion i will try and explain why Although fentanyl and midazolam can contribute to hypotension and bradycardia, the patient's level of sedation is appropriate based on the RASS. Reductions in infusion rate for these drugs could cause shivering or further hemodynamic instability to develop. Providing a fluid challenge could help with hypotension but it may not help with the patient's bradycardia. The bradycardia could be from TTM itself or it could be drug-induced. At this time it should be managed by eliminating drugs that can decrease the heart rate. An increase in the norepinephrine infusion rate is an option that may help with hypotension and bradycardia, but it could cause an increase in heart rate leading to atrial or ventricular arrhythmia. Since the patient experienced atrial fibrillation and it is unclear if it is due to the norepinephrine infusion, increasing the norepinephrine infusion rate is not the best choice for this patient. The amiodarone infusion should be discontinued because it can contribute to hypotension and bradycardia in this patient. Due to the slowed enzymatic function during TTM and the drug's long half-life and large volume of distribution, amiodarone can contribute to hypotension and bradycardia. Although bolus doses also have the potential to cause hypotension and bradycardia, they can be infused over a longer period of time to decrease the adverse effects. Literature with TTM suggests the use of intermittent bolus doses to minimize adverse effects and prolonged effects of those medications with long half-lives. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, WAF, a 46-year-old male patient presents to your accident and emergency department with an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and ventricular fibrillation. He has no significant past medical history. The Code Blue team, which was called intervenes and achieves return of spontaneous circulation after one round of defibrillation in the field. WAFCCG reveals ST segment elevations in leads V1 to V4. WAF has a proximal left anterior descending, abbreviated as LAD artery occlusion and is given loading doses of aspirin 325 mg orally stat and clopidogrel 600 mg orally stat, followed by placement of a drug eluting stent, abbreviated as DES, in your cath lab. After 48 hours in the CTICU, WAF experiences ventricular fibrillation again, is defibrillated once, followed by a loading dose of amiodarone. He is taken back to the cardiac catheterization lab and found to have an extension of the thrombus to the mid-LAD requiring placement of a second drug eluting stent. So my question to you is, which of the following would be the best option for P2Y12 management in WAF's clinical scenario? Would it be a. Initiate an eptifibotide IV infusion. Or b. Additional therapy with an oral loading dose or IV infusion is not needed. Or, C. Reload with prosugal 60 mg orally stat, or would it be, D. Reload with clopidogrel 600 mg orally stat. I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, C. Reload with prosugal 60 mg orally stat. The patient was already loaded with clopidogrel and although it is a reasonable choice, the patient is experiencing a second event, demonstrating that clopidogrel is ineffective or peak inhibition of platelet activation has not yet occurred. Therefore, reloading with clopidogrel is not the best choice for this patient. 
the patient is experiencing a second ACS event requiring placement of another drug eluting stent to the LAD artery thus necessitating a more potent P2Y12 inhibitor and reloading due to platelet reactivation. There is potential clopidogrel non-responsiveness since the patient was already given a dose of clopidogrel and maintenance therapy for 48 hours and had a second ACS. Additionally, the patient has an extensive clot in the proximal and mid-LAD with two drug eluting stents. Due to the potential for an in-stent thrombosis with extensive coronary disease and because the patient has no additional contraindications or increased risk of bleeding, prosugal is the best option for this patient. Giving no additional P2Y12 inhibitor therapy is not appropriate for this patient. An infusion of a GP2B3A inhibitor is a reasonable option because it will prevent further platelet aggregation, however, the patient should be given two bolus doses and not only a continuous infusion of EPTE febatide. If the patient were unable to take oral antiplatelet therapy, administration of two bolus doses of EPTE febatide followed by a continuous infusion would be the best option. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, which of the characteristics listed below is associated with a high risk of recurrent intracerebral hemorrhage, abbreviated as ICH, according to guidelines from the American Heart Association AHA, American Stroke Association ASA, is it A. Young age, or B. Non-lobar location of the initial bleed or, c, Asian ethnicity. Or is it, d, apolipoprotein E epsilon 2 epsilon 4 alleles? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is D, apolipoprotein E epsilon 2 epsilon 4 alleles. I will try and explain why. According to the AHAASA guidelines, apolipoprotein E epsilon 2 epsilon 4 alleles are associated with a high risk of recurrent ICH. The AHAASA guidelines do not identify any particular race or ethnicity as a risk factor for recurrent ICH. According to the AHAASA guidelines, a lobar location of the initial hemorrhage is associated with a high risk of recurrent ICH. According to the AHAASA guidelines, older age, not younger age, is associated with a high risk of recurrent ICH. Please advance to the next question. And the next question reads, LVF, a 64-year-old male patient presented to your accident and emergency department with acute intracerebral hemorrhage, abbreviated as ICH, while taking dabagatran for atrial fibrillation. The emergency medicine team administered idarucizumab 5 grams IV over a 10-minute period to LVF. Four hours after receiving this dose, LVF's mental status rapidly declines. A repeat neuroimaging is done and it shows continued hematoma enlargement. So my question to you is, which of the agents listed below would be the most appropriate hemostatic agent to recommend in LVF's clinical scenario? Would it be A. Vitamin K or B. Idarucizumab, or, C, recombinant factor 7A. Or would it be, D, fresh frozen plasma? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, B. Idarucizumab and I will explain why. 
Fresh frozen plasma should be avoided in patients with dabigatran-associated ICH because it is unclear whether it is effective for reversing the anticoagulant effects of dabigatran. Recombinant factor 7A abbreviated as R, F7A, should be avoided in patients with dabigatran-associated ICH. In animal models, R, F7A did not shorten the bleeding time associated with dabigatran. In patients with evidence of continued dabigatran-associated bleeding despite idorucizumab administration, a second 5 grams dose of idorucizumab should be considered. Vitamin K is unlikely to be effective for reversing continued bleeding associated with dabigatran. Currently there are no data to support its use for this purpose. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, PKP, a 54-year-old male patient is rushed to your accident and emergency department after falling from his bike and hitting his head on asphalt pavement. The CT scan shows that PKP has a traumatic subdural hematoma and intraparenchymal hemorrhage. PKP requires emergent surgical intervention as a life-saving measure. He has a past medical history significant for atrial fibrillation. He currently takes a Pixaban 5 mg orally twice daily. The time of his last dose is unknown now. So my question to you is, which of the interventions listed below would be the most appropriate initial treatment strategy for PKP? Would it be a. High dose Andixa Net Alpha or b. Standard dose Andixa Net Alpha or c. Activated Prothrombin Complex Concentrate 50 units per kilogram or would it be d. Three-factor prothrombin complex concentrate 50 units per kilogram? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, C, activated prothrombin complex concentrate 50 units per kilogram and I will explain why. Three-factor prothrombin complex concentrate is not appropriate for PKP, according to the guidelines on reversal of antithrombotics in ICH by Frontera and colleagues. A 2016 guideline for reversal of antithrombotics in intracerebral hemorrhage ICH, recommends that initial treatment of patients like PKP with intracerebral hemorrhage consist of an activated or four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate at a dose of 50 units per kilogram. This patient requires emergent surgical intervention. Patients requiring emergent surgical intervention were excluded from the ANNEXA4 trial that demonstrated benefit from Andixa Net Alpha. Andixa Net Alpha is infused over two hours, which probably would delay surgical intervention. Therefore, Andixa Net Alpha is not appropriate for PKP. High dose therapy would not be appropriate based on the patient's home apixaban dosage of 5 mg twice a day and the unknown time since his last dose. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, AIR, a 38-year-old male patient who is hospitalized for acute pulmonary embolism and started on anoxaparin 80 mg subcutaneously every 12 hours. AIR experiences acute loss of consciousness, and an emergent CT scan is done. It reveals a new intraparenchymal hemorrhage. AIR's last dose of anoxaparin was administered four hours prior to his loss of consciousness. So my question to you is, which of the following would be the most appropriate protamine sulfate dose to administer in order to reverse the anticoagulant effects of anoxaparin in AIR's clinical scenario? Would it be a. 80 mg, or b. 
70 mg or circa 50 mg or would it be d 40 mg I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options And the correct answer is C, 50 mg and I will tell you why. For patients like AIR who require reversal of anoxaparin doses that were administered within 8 hours prior to the onset of signs or symptoms of intracerebral hemorrhage ICH, protamine sulfate should be administered in a 1 mg to 1 mg ratio up to a maximum dose of 50 mg. For patients who require reversal of anoxaparin doses administered 8 to 12 hours prior to the onset of ICH signs or symptoms, the ratio of protamine sulfate to anoxaparin is 0.5 mg to 1 mg up to a maximum of 50 mg. Although AIR received 80 mg of anoxaparin 4 hours prior to loss of consciousness, the appropriate protamine sulfate dose is 50 mg. A 40 mg dose is an insufficient dose to administer in this situation. A 70 mg dose exceeds the maximum recommended protamine sulfate dose of 50 mg. An 80 mg dose exceeds the maximum recommended protamine sulfate dose of 50 mg. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, GMP, a 69-year-old female patient is admitted to your CCU for intracerebral hemorrhage. GMP's most recent blood pressure and heart rate are 182 systolic 110 diastolic, and 58 beats per minute at 12 noon, 190 systolic, 112 diastolic, and 59 beats per minute at 1 pm and 198 systolic 120 diastolic, and 56 beats per minute at 2 pm. So my question to you is, which of the treatment regimens listed below would be the most appropriate for GMP's clinical scenario now. Would it be a. Hydralazine 100 mg orally thrice daily with parameters for withholding doses. Or b. Metaprolol succinate 50 mg orally in the morning or, circa IV labetalol 20 mg IV bolus over 2 minutes for systolic blood pressure above 160 mm of mercury. Or would it be, D, IV nicardipine 5 mg per hour by IV infusion? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, D, IV nicardipine 5 mg per hour by IV infusion. GMP's systolic blood pressure is above 180 mm of mercury but below 200 mm of mercury. Appropriate options for blood pressure reduction include intermittent or continuous intravenous medications. Nicardipine is the best choice because the patient has a heart rate below 60 beats per minute and may not tolerate intermittent labetalol. Although intermittent intravenous medications are an appropriate option, GMP's heart rate is currently below 60 beats per minute so she may not tolerate IV labetalol due to the risk of bradycardia. Oral medications are not an appropriate option for this patient. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom.
and if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arua, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 205.